right. We are now recording. Wonderful. So last week we looked at Genesis chapters 1 through 11. This evening we are looking at chapters 12 all the way through 50. So this is a, uh, a very big section of scripture. There are a lot of stories here and uh, it would be impossible for me to cover all of them comprehensively. So I want to remind you all that the purpose of this lecture is to um, highlight some of the big overarching themes and ideas. So if you have those in your head, you will be able to understand the stories themselves, the details uh, in a better way. Okay. So first we should, um, it's, it's worth uh, kind of talking about this word patriarch. It comes from the, from a Greek word for father or um, patros. And um, these patriarchal figures are very uh, important, uh, foundational really, for the, the nation of Israel, the people of God, and therefore for the entire uh, narrative, the unfolding of the Old Testament. Um, the biblical patriarchs themselves, it can be said, are the line of people used by God to establish the nation of Israel. Um, perhaps the most well-known of these patriarchs is Abraham, because from him all of the Israelites are descended. And as we will discuss uh, in a few minutes, um, all people of the Islamic faith, people who call themselves Muslims, also trace their um, heritage, their lineage back to Abraham. Um, God made a covenant with Abraham. That's an important word that we will return to promising that Abraham would be the father of many nations. Um, and then uh, a very significant moment occurs in the story when God changes uh, the name. Uh, originally it was Abram. He changes his name to Abraham, which means something like the father of, of a great multitude, the father of many people. Okay. Now, God's plan uh, and purpose for Israel was to maintain uh, a pure people, a holy people that is set apart for a purpose of, of loving and serving this God, Yahweh. And it's, it's important to remember here uh, what we uh, discussed in the, in the lecture last week, that God becomes um, saddened, deeply troubled and frustrated by um, humankind's continuing and increasing sinfulness. But we recall that originally in the garden, the purpose of uh, humanity was to love and to care for creation and also to display uh, God's love, uh, to bear his image to the rest of this creation. So um, God now, um, beginning in Genesis chapter 12, begins something new, something fresh. And he is using, uh, we, we, we are going to learn, uh, a, a small group of people to accomplish his purposes. And eventually he wants to spread his name, his love throughout the whole earth. Uh, another really important uh, image that is used throughout the Old Testament is this idea of light shining in darkness. And so we see on many occasions that God wants his people to be like a light on a hill, like a lighthouse shining out, um, demonstrating the, the correct way to live, the best way to live, really. So um, that is this, this unfolding of the patriarchal narrative that we are going to find um, in the people that are called Israel. I have um, just a, a few of the big themes, the kind of ways that we can approach this that I want to share um, before we look at the first patriarch, who is Abraham. Um, one of the themes that I think is really fascinating, really exciting, is, is what I like to call these apparent dead ends or, or, or roadblocks at the end of a road. God has made certain promises and has given the, the patriarchs reason to believe that th certain things will happen. But time and time again, we will notice that something comes into uh, the story that seems to thwart or block 
or extinguish the possibility for God to accomplish these things. And so we will see um, some, some tragic uh, um, elements in the story. We will see the inability to conceive children or uh, what we can call infertility. When God has uh, promised the, um, the growth of this nation. <laughs> and so these apparent dead ends are um, used by God, uh, we could say, to uh, enhance people's trust in him or to stretch their faith so that they are remembering it is not by their own means, but by God's uh, divine word that these things will be accomplished. Another really uh, wonderful and um, beautiful theme is this idea of weakness triumphing over strength. We will see this uh, spelled out time and time again, that the unexpected people, the unexpected characters are the ones God chooses to accomplish his purposes. They are the ones who God uh, selects to, uh, to spread his love, to communicate his power and his messages. Um, yet another theme that goes along with that has to do with undeserved blessing, undeserved grace, and undeserved mercy. These um, characters, these patriarchs, are, are, are not necessarily um, the most deserving of, of God's goodness, of God's blessing. But we are reminded, we see the connection to the original uh, primeval narratives of creation, that it's God's intention to make, to create, and to uh, lavish his, his love on creation. And he chooses to do that in a way that is... Uh, often surprising to us. Another theme, one of the reasons this is so surprising has to do with the, uh, the messiness that we encounter in these narratives. The patriarchs are far from perfect. These characters, uh, just like the characters we saw in the first 11 chapters, are sinful. They make mistakes. They are disobedient. They rebel against God. There are so many examples of deceit and trickery and um, even backstabbing. And it's really, really important for us to note that this biblical narrative does not try to conceal these sinful behaviors. It does not try to cover them up or to whitewash them. It is very honest. It is very frank about the uh, mistakes that the, and the sins that these patriarchs commit. And the reason this is important is because it stands in stark contrast to the um, foundation narratives, the myths of the surrounding peoples, the surrounding nations. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with epic heroes of nations like Greece. You, we have uh, Troy, we have Hercules, who are, who are these very strong, very heroic, um, almost perfect figures. We also have, um, we talked about last week in the, in the epic of Gilgamesh, um, f these, these kind of ancestors, these forefathers who are, who are semi-divine. They are, they are descended from the gods. And so whether you were an ancient Greek or a Roman or Egyptian, you would point backwards and you say, we are a great people because our ancestors were great. But God is doing something very, very different here in the patriarchal narrative. And the people of Israel must remember, we are not great because our ancestors are great. No, we are great because our God is great. In fact, he has selected the weak people. He has selected people who, who behave in embarrassing ways because by doing so, it seems that God is able to magnify his glory, his love, his goodness, all the more. One final theme uh, that we touched upon last week has to do with this God. Yahweh Elohim is his name. This God is an intimate and a personal God. He is not distant 
like the gods of Egypt, like the gods of Greece. He is, he is a God who communicates with his people, Israel. He is a God who um, interacts with them in a very uh, personal, very down-to-earth way. And we are going to see that, or I will mention that briefly again in some of the stories. We see God coming down and visiting Abraham. We see God coming down and wrestling with Jacob, one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. So all of these themes work together to tell us a story that, that portrays and, and highlights this God, Yahweh Elohim, as a loving God who chooses to do things in ways that sometimes, that often don't make sense to us. So if we can remember those themes, these ideas, I think it will help us make sense of, of some of the strangeness that we will encounter in these patriarchal narratives. Um, I want to uh, very quickly then show a graphic because I know that many people are kind of more visual learners that will connect, that will kind of bridge the, uh, the primeval narrative to the patriarchal narrative that we are now going to be talking about. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, because Reverend Kasoy is not here this evening, I would be very appreciative if somebody could just um, vocally tell me if you see this image. Do you see this right here? Can you? Yeah. The screen that I'm there. sharing? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank yes. you. I can see it. Wonderful. Thank you. So let's talk yes. about Wonderful. this Thank you. very yeah, briefly yeah. here. Um, we saw in the primeval narrative, of course, um, several instances of God's judgment. This is not because God is mean or vindictive. It is because God cares so greatly about his creation and he is so grieved by sin that he must put a stop to sin whenever it is to be found. He must do whatever is necessary to um, prevent sin from, from damaging his creation. So Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. That is a, a very uh, firm judgment. But we remember that there is a promise of redemption through the seed of the woman. God says, this is not the end. I am, I'm going to create a way. I'm, I'm going to um, work a plan that is going to bring salvation for the whole world. Cain, we remember, was banished from the presence of God for murdering his brother Abel. But in the midst of that messiness, in the midst of that sin, God still places a mark on Cain so that no one will take vengeance. We recall in Genesis chapter 6 that there was a flood brought upon the earth. However, God saved eight souls in the ark, Noah and his family. And then finally, as I mentioned already, in Genesis chapter 11, we find the confusion of languages and nations dispersed at the tower of, of Babel, Babel or the, or the ziggurat. However, we will see beginning in chapter 12, God selects this person named Abram to be a blessing to all the nations. So we, we must keep these in mind, even though it seems like God might be punishing the nations or or doing something mean or unfair. He, he, he has a plan, and he's very intentionally working that plan in a way that is going to demonstrate his love and his goodness to all the people of the earth. So we will come back now. I will stop sharing that screen for now. I want to provide, before we begin with Abraham, Abraham or Abram. Does anybody have any comments or questions about the introduction I have given so far? Very well. We will begin by looking at the first patriarch. I should mention that there are three primary um, patriarchs of, of the nation of Israel. They are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The reason why these three are so commonly um, viewed as the, as the main patriarchs has to do with 
many, many references in the Old Testament to uh, these three names together. God will say over and over and over again, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. And he'll say, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So we see repeated in the, in the narrative of uh, God's people, reference to these three patriarchs. And we will begin by looking at the first one, uh, Abram. God, uh, you may recall, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 10, I mentioned last week that there's this list of all the nations of the world. And Israel is not listed among uh, those nations. Israel at this time does not exist as a nation. They are nothing. And I hope that reminds you of, of what we discussed last week also. In the creation accounts, there was a, a particular verb we discussed, uh, bara, and it, had, it, it has to do with a divine uh, person, a divine being, creating something out of nothing. We, we, we remember that God uh, created the world. He spoke it into being by his divine word. And so we are seeing a continuation of this, uh, this character of God choosing to create a nation out of nothing. So we first encounter uh, Abraham as his name was Abram. And we are not told much about him, but he seems to be a somewhat obscure, uh, insignificant person. There's nothing necessarily great about him. And in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram to leave his home land and go somewhere else. And uh, this call will be something very uh, significant later on because uh, God, uh, it, the Bible tells us that Abram believed God. He, he, he trusted what God was saying. And uh, later on in the Bible, we are told that this is credited to Abram as righteousness. So from this very uh, strange and kind of surprising beginning, we eventually reach a point in uh, chapter 15 of Genesis where God makes with Abraham what is called a covenant. And I mentioned this is going to be an important word. So if you're taking notes, please do write this word down. Uh, here, I'll put it in the chat so you all can, uh, uh, can, can see it written. Does anybody uh, have any ideas from your reading so far? Would you, like to, would you like to share your understanding of this word covenant? It's very important in the Bible. By raise of hand, please do, uh, please do somebody share. Brian, yes, thank you. Covenant is just a, a contract between two parties. Okay. So if you all didn't hear that, Brian used another term. He said a contract. That's good. That's good, Brian. Thank you for sharing that. Um, who else is it? Um, Muzioka, could you please share? Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Koki, you have your hand raised. You are first in the queue. Could you share? Okay, we'll move on to, uh, I think, uh, Shepard, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, uh, I just want to add that uh, I agree that uh, it's a contract or an agreement between Wonderful. two or more parties, and it should be honored. Very Both good. Both parties must honor that agreement, contract, or a covenant. That's great, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Nizioka, Rebecca, Koki, are you able to unmute yourself and share? Okay, we are not hearing, but I'm seeing also several very good comments in the chat, uh, an agreement between two or more parties. This is wonderful. Um, let, me, let me read a, uh, a definition for us that is going to uh, kind of uh, enhance that basic understanding. 
especially as it concerns the way that this idea is um, is found in the Bible in the Old Testament. Oh yes, I see. Uh, Hannah has a very good uh, um, statement too. In addition, uh, she includes God. This is this is very important. Let me read. Let me read a definition for us. A covenant is a formal and legally binding contract that. That implies that there are, there are consequences, if it is broken, between two parties. In the Bible, there are at least two main types, and, and these are important for us to remember. The first is, uh, it can be called a parity contract, which, which gives us a, this idea that the two parties are, are basically on equal terms, okay? We encounter this in the patriarchal narrative between... Um, Abraham and Abimelech, Abraham and Melchizedek, they're kind of, they're both humans, they're, they're kind of on the same terms. Um, and then there's another type of contract where the two parties are very clearly on different levels, okay? And this can be called a promissory covenant because the, the, the party in a higher position is, is promising something to the party in a lower position. I am going to enter these terms in the in the chat. We have uh, parity and promissory. So um, these are very uh, important because the covenant that God makes with Abram is going to be the the latter type, the promissory covenant. We 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 must remember that God is not on the same terms as Abram, and that is pretty clearly communicated in the text. Um, there are similarities, it should be said, to other types of um, covenants that were, that were common in the ancient world at this time. Um, in fact, most people made agreements that were important in this way. They did not have paper. They did not have pens to write or to sign a, a contract or a document. And so they tended to make agreements in this way. Um, does anybody remember, before we, before we move on, there was actually another covenant that was made in the primeval narrative after the flood happened. Does anybody remember and would like to share what that covenant was? Nice. Um, when God, hello. Yes, go ahead, Daniel. Yes. Yeah, when God promised uh, never to destroy the earth again with the flood. Wonderful. That is correct. Um, I saw the other hands from from Hannah. Thank you for participating, Daniel. You are you are absolutely correct. Um, God, after He um, uh, d does the flood to to destroy sinfulness. He, he does something very, uh, very significant. He, he takes his, uh, the symbolic weapon he has, which is a bow, right? As in a bow and arrows. And he, and, he, and he takes it and he sets it down. And he says, I am no longer going to act in this way um, because of human sinfulness. So we are told the sign of that covenant is that whenever we see a rainbow in the sky, that shape, which represents to us the, the, the symbolic bow, the weapon of God, we are, God is never going to uh, exact his, his, his wrath in that way on, on humankind again. So that is, the, that is the first of actually several covenants that God will make. The second one is this covenant with Abraham. And then there is another covenant we will discuss next week probably uh, which is which is between God and his people on on Mount Sinai and there are other kind of uh, rules the Ten Commandments uh, instructions really are given at that time so let's talk about the details uh, I, uh, uh, Hannah your hand is raised do you have a question I uh, no, sorry it's just by accident oh okay okay no problem um, there Let's let's talk about the details of this um, this covenant because it it's kind of strange. Uh, it's it, I want to reiterate, emphasize that it, this was very common among peoples of this time. So the original readers or actually hearers of this story would have been familiar. Uh, 
what, what occurred was that the two parties would take an animal or several animals and they would kill them and then they would cut them in half so that there were two pieces. They would put them on the ground and the way that this covenant was sealed or uh, kind of agreed upon was that each party would walk through the two halves of these carcasses and they would say, just as these carcasses, these animals are, are rend in two, so also should be the consequence for whoever breaks this covenant. So we see Abraham does his part, but then he falls asleep and, and something kind of strange happens. We, we read that a flaming pot passes between these two halves. And we are to understand this flaming pot represents God, Yahweh Elohim, as fulfilling his part of the covenant. And throughout the Bible, fire or flames, this imagery uh, is going to be used to, to represent the presence of God. We will see that in, in stories in the coming weeks. So we are to understand that this well-understood form of an agreement was uh, entered into by both Abram and by God, and that there were certain uh, stipulations attached to that um, in basic form. God was saying that he would give a land and, and, and cause Abraham to become a great nation, and Abraham should follow God and should obey him and should uh, keep the uh, instructions that God was going to be uh, giving him. That is uh, spelled out in, uh, in several more stages, really. Uh, when we get to uh, the next uh, patriarch, uh, Isaac especially, and there's a really, um, this is kind of a segue into the story of Isaac, the, the second patriarch. There's a really fascinating story that occurs in Genesis chapter 22. In this story, actually, let me back up just a moment. I forgot <laughs> to I forgot to talk about this part. Remember, I mentioned the apparent roadblocks, the 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 instances where it seems like God's promise is going to be thwarted. So after God makes his covenant with Abraham, he promises he will be this great nation, a, a father of many many nations. It takes a very long time, and, and Abraham and Sarah are, are not able to have a child. And, and they get very frustrated, and they, and they lose hope because they think, how are we going to be the, the parents of this great, great nation if we do not even have one child? How can we have many, many children if we do not have the first child? And so that is the, the apparent kind of roadblock frustrating this this promise and we see uh as a response to that uh concern uh an example of the sinfulness the rebelliousness the the very uh kind of human nature of of abraham and his wife sarah so uh what happens is they decide to uh, circumvent or try to produce on their own the fulfillment of God's promise to them, which was heirs, um, children. And so what Sarah does is she has a, a servant or a, a handmaiden called Hagar. And she says, Abraham, why don't you take this uh, servant of mine and have sexual relations with her so that to see if she may give us a child. And so Abraham does this, and indeed, uh, a child is born from that, um, from that uh, encounter, and uh, that child's name is Ishmael. And at this point, it is uh, relevant to mention, because I know that some of us here on the call are um, part of the Islamic faith. Some of us here are, are Muslims. It is important to mention that uh, Muslims trace their lineage, their heritage back through Ishmael, and thereby connecting to Abraham. So even though Abraham and Sarah disobey God, or, or I guess it's not really fair to say they disobey, 
they, they try to force the result on their own. That's what happens. They are demonstrating a lack of faith in God to accomplish the promise that he communicated to them. Even though they did that, God does not uh, fault Ishmael. And so there are other promises made in the book of Genesis to Ishmael, uh, the prophecies that are made. And God says, in fact, Ishmael himself will become the father of a great nation and they will be very strong and they will be successful in certain ways. And so that is uh, an important aside to make because uh, um, we sh Christians and, and Jews share this, um, this portion of our faith with, uh, with Muslims. Now, after um, a very, very, very long time of, of no child being born, Finally, when Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 years old, a child is born to them. Isaac is his name. And in case some of you think that there is no humor in the Bible, uh, Isaac, the name means something like he laughs. And Sarah herself in the story uh, laughs uh, at God, really, when God says, I will give you a child even in your old age. But here's, here's something that very mysterious that, that occurs. After Isaac is uh, a, a pretty uh, grown to a, to a certain maturity, God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And this seems to, to go beyond comprehension. How could God ask Abraham to sacrifice his only son, through whom this promise of a great nation was going to be fulfilled. And so in this story, uh, there are, again, Bible scholars would, would um, point to similarities in the surrounding nations. At that time, there was the, the practice of, of child sacrifice um, uh, was, was somewhat common at this time. But in this story, we encounter God once again uh, doing something that, that seems to defy or go against our understanding, our logic. And, and what God is doing is he is testing the faith of Abraham. Abraham was initially faithful when he left his homeland to go to the land God was calling him towards. Abraham was faithful by entering into the covenant. But was Abraham still all the way faithful? Did he still completely trust God? And so... The story you, you should read for yourself, it's a very good story, occurs in, in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, they gather the wood and they go up on this mountain where the sacrifice is going to happen. And right when Abraham is about to, with the knife, uh, kill Isaac, uh, an angel of God provides a, a ram, an animal, to take his place. Okay? This story is, is hugely important for several reasons. And last night, Somebody asked a very interesting question, ask, actually. They asked, is this story an example of, uh, of, does it deal mainly with Abraham's faith or his obedience? And I responded by saying both. It demonstrates that even though he doesn't understand it, Abraham is, is being obedient to God by following through. And it demonstrates that even though he doesn't understand it, Abraham trusts that somehow God is going to be able to accomplish his promise to Abraham, even though it seems like that promise is going to be um, cut off or killed in that moment. So this is kind of the climax. And when I was, when I was a boy in uh, learning about this story, I had a teacher who maybe was not the best teacher <laughs> Because uh, they, they use this story, uh, or they were talking about the, the idea that uh, God does not tempt uh, his people. And that is true, because God is perfectly loving. God is, there is no sin in God. God cannot tempt us to do something that is sinful. But God absolutely, 100%, will test his people. He will test their faith. And testing is very different from tempting. Tempting involves something that is sinful. Testing does not involve anything that is sinful. So God tests Abraham's faith. Abraham passes the test, we could say, I suppose. 
And then we get this final reiteration of the covenant. And I want to read this for us because it is very important. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we are going to be reading um, Genesis chapter 22. This is right after, uh, uh, right after the, uh, the story about, um, about uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Can you all see my, my Bible here? Somebody just speak quickly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very yeah, good. Yeah. So, so we will oh, be the, reading over here in the English, clearly. beginning in uh, verse 15. I will read. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, I solemnly swear by my own name, decrees the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply your descendants. Now, here, the, one of the reasons I'm going to show you this, uh, this, this idea is repeated. This is not the first time we've seen this idea of many, many descendants. But something else is involved in this promise that I want to show you. Most English translations, including this one, um, add some words. This one says, so that they will be as countless as the stars. But that's not what the Hebrew text says. If you notice, I'm hovering over this word countless, and there's nothing that comes up because it's not in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew over here simply says, I will multiply your descendants, and they will be as the stars. Uh, they will be as the stars in the heaven, Hashamayim, and they will be as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the stronghold of the enemies because you have obeyed me. All the nations or the earth will pronounce blessings on one another using the name of your descendants. Now, why did I emphasize that minor detail? It's because not only are the stars numerous, but the stars are very bright. And remember I mentioned before this theme of the people of Israel being an example to the surrounding nations. God is saying to Abraham, not only will your descendants be many in number, not only will they be great, but they will be as the stars and they will be shining like a light to, to show the nations how they are supposed to live because God is going to be using this, this nation he is, he, is, he is growing, this nation of Israel, to be kind of a prototype, an example of how to live in the best possible way, how to live in this covenant relationship with a loving God, the creator of the universe. So this idea of light is, is, a really, is a really beautiful idea, and it's repeated time and time again in the Bible. We will see in the book of Isaiah, for instance, the nation of Israel is called to be a light to the nations. Some of you, if you know the story that in the New Testament, you know that um, the people representing the nations are led to Jesus as a baby because of a star in the heavens. So we should keep this in our minds. Even though Israel uh, is going to mess up and, and continue to disobey, God's intention for them is to be in a relationship with God. Remember that relationship in the garden. Be in a close relationship with God and model what it is like, what it should look like to be obedient and to follow the God of the universe. So that is the basic uh, story of Abraham. And he, the mo he has the most focus because he is the most important or the, the, the original. And uh, we don't need to go into detail, but um, I did mention that when, when, God, when this covenant is finalized, God changes his name, God changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, which means something like the father of a great multitude. And we are going to see another name change happen uh, with another patriarch. We, are, we will get there in a moment, but I want to pause and allow time for questions and, and to make sure that we are all on the same page. Does anybody have a question or a comment? Does it make sense, everything I have said so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm glad. Very good. 
Very well. We will move on then to the next patriarch, whose name is Isaac, the son of Abraham, who was almost killed, but not quite. Oh, interesting. I, I just got a question here from Lara uh, Kavutsi. Is there a difference between Christian and Jews? Yes, absolutely. There's a very big difference. Um, I don't want to go too far off our topic, but um, in the most simple way, uh, Jews will only uh, hold the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, they call the Hebrew Bible, as their sacred scriptures. And they do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah in fulfillment of those scriptures. Christians, on the other hand, get the term Christian from Christ. They recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. And so we have also the New Testament, which we, uh, we understand Jesus to be the fulfillment, this, this Messiah who was expected in the Old Testament. Um, it's a very, very brief and simple an uh, answer to your question. But let us get back to our story at hand. We're going to go to the next patriarch, whose name is Isaac. And um, in, in this story, Isaac, if, if Abraham's story kind of represents to us these ideas of faith and covenant, Isaac's story really has, uh, shows us in a, very, in a very clear way this idea of God's provision and also a new word, called typology. This is another term that you will want to write down. I'm going to put it here in the chat, typology. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, saw any similarities in the story with Isaac, those of you who are, who are Christians who maybe know the story of Jesus, but for a long time, Christians have noticed similarities in this story of Isaac to the story of Jesus. Isaac was, for example, Abraham's only son. Isaac was old enough. Uh, he, at this point, he was not just a little toddler. He was old enough to have, he could have resisted if he wanted to. So he was old enough to um, willingly give himself up as a sacrifice to accomplish something greater. Just as Jesus willingly gave himself up as a sacrifice in, in death on a cross. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on this idea of typology, but it's, it's useful for us to note because this is a very big, very big theme in a lot of the study of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. And it consists of, um, I'll put two more terms in here, a type, and then also what's called an anti-type, which corresponds with the type. So it, at its most basic form, this is what's going on. Uh, this method of biblical interpretation recognizes a, uh, a person, an event, or an institution as the type, kind of like a model. And that is in the Old Testament. And it corresponds or it points to or it matches up, it pairs with an anti-type, which happens in the New Testament. But the most important... Um, consideration here is that it's not just uh, about anything. It's not a, you know, I see a cow in the Old Testament. Oh, and I see a cow in the New Testament. So they, maybe they're connected. This, these connections are only to be understood within the framework of salvation history. That is the way that God is choosing to uh, demonstrate his love to, to work his redemption in the story of humanity, okay? So that's uh, another important concept for you to just uh, remember and, and tuck away. Now let's talk about Isaac in a bit more detail. At the beginning of his life, of course, we remember, Isaac seems to be a man of, of great faith. Uh, there's not only the story in Genesis 22 with his sacrifice, but when it comes to uh, finding a, a wife, uh, he demonstrates faith because uh, a miraculous story occurs. You can read about it in chapter 24 of Genesis. A servant is sent to uh, the land of Abraham, his, his, the former land of Abraham, and, um, and uh, a wife is selected for Isaac. Uh, 
uh, in order to continue this, uh, you know, this great nation of, of people. And it takes them a long time to get pregnant. They also have a difficulty with conceiving. But when they do, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, becomes pregnant with twins. These twins' names are uh, Esau and Jacob. And God tells them, uh, the parents, that, uh, that Jacob, the younger one, is going, to, uh, is going to be the one through whom God works. And this goes against the uh, logical understanding they had, the cultural understanding of the time, which was that the firstborn, Esau, should, should have been the one who received the blessing, should have been the one who, who, uh, who uh, kind of is the more important one to carry on the legacy of the family. So this harkens back to that idea, that theme I mentioned, that God is choosing to work in a way that might not make sense to us always. And even though Isaac was faithful to God in the beginning, he, uh, he seems to rebel against God by attempting to bless Esau, his older son. Those of you familiar with the story, or if you have read this story already, you will know that, there, that this is one of the instances where we encounter some trickery, some deceit. Jacob uh, is the one who uh, is associated with this trickery or this deceit this dishonesty or deception. When they come out of the womb, Jacob is grabbing onto the heel of his brother uh, Esau. And so sometimes he is called the heel grabber. Uh, his name means something like a, like a supplanter or a, or a trickster. But what he does is uh, he disguises himself as his older brother Esau in order to kind of seize or steal almost the blessing from his older brother. This is a very uh, interesting narrative, and there is a lot to be said. There's a lot that uh, can be said. Uh, okay, this is a good question from Fatma. I, I will spell it, the, the latter spelling. Esau, at least uh, in English, is how it is spelled. Um, good question. And the reason... One of the reasons, I should say, not the only, one of the reasons that God seems to do this is because he wants to demonstrate that his ways of doing things, again, God, like I said already, God delights in using the younger, in using the weaker, in using the unexpected people to accomplish his plan so that God's love, God's strength, God's wisdom will be put on display, will be highlighted, because God is going against the, the logical way of doing things. It is not going to be the older son, Esau, the, the stronger one. In, in this story, Esau is this is this kind of depicted as this very masculine, very hairy, very strong uh, kind of hunter. But no, no, God is going to choose the weak one. And God does this again and again and again, we'll see, with the young, young sons, uh, the kind of runts, of, of the litter as it, as it were. Okay. I have some questions here. Um, see on my connection. What does the life of Ishmael brother of Isaac as a non-Muslim Christian, uh, bring us? That is a very good question. I'm trying to think. Uh, so I think what you mean is what can we learn from Ishmael, even though we are not Muslims, we are, we are Christians. My answer to that question would be this. We learn that even though God has his um, plan to, to work through the nation of Israel, God does not forget about all the other nations. And throughout the Old Testament, God is demonstrating that he is thinking about these other nations, these other people. He still loves them. He has plans for them. They are not... Um, they are not simply dismissed outrightly because they are not Israelites. The thing we have to remember and hold in a bit of tension is that God is choosing this nation Israel, building them really, establishing them, 
so that they can be this example, this model, this prototype for all the other nations. And God has this intimate relationship with them. But the intention all along, even from Abraham, if you remember, God's intention <laughs> is to bless all of the nations of Israel <laughs> through Israel. Okay? So he does not um, dismiss, he does not ignore Ishmael and all of his descendants or the other descendants that we encounter um, in this narrative. I have another question. Christians believe in Jesus as Messiah, but Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. Yes, Abdullah, that is, um, that is a good uh, summary of one of those differences. So we have now talked, again, very briefly, not comprehensively. We have talked briefly about um, Abraham, and we have talked about Isaac. Uh, that brings us to uh, the third patriarch, whose name is Jacob, who we've already encountered. Jacob is his name in Hebrew. So um, this, uh, I think, is a really pro probably the most prominent uh, example of the, the messiness, the trickery, the deception <laughs> that, is, uh, that can be found within these patriarchs. Um, in this story of, of Jacob and all of his, his sons, there is incest. There is uh, murder. There is there is backstabbing, um, and uh, God chooses to use this and and work in the midst of all of this messiness. I see a question really quickly here from Victoria: um, Is Moses also among the patriarchs? So this depends slightly on on how people count and and how they consider. Um, in for our purposes here. Uh, Moses does not fit within this patriarchal narrative in Genesis. Um, probably it's better to talk about Moses as a prophet, one of the first prophets, even though he is, he is very, very significant. He has, he's kind of like a patriarch in that um, we talk about the books of Moses. But for this lecture, we're just working through the chapters 12 through 50 of Genesis um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the main patriarchs. Like I mentioned, their names are repeated over and over again. We will discuss um, one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, who is kind of like a kind of functions as a patriarch. Okay. So we have this story of Jacob, and there's one more important term that I want you all to write down or remember. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. This term is election. Have any of you encountered this in your reading so far? Do you have any um, understanding of this that you could please share with the rest of us? The idea of election. Anybody? It does not have to be a perfect answer. I would just like to hear your understanding of this term. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, go ahead, Shepard. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, if uh, the idea of election, I think I understand it as a calling or one okay. who is chosen by God to be used for a specific task ah, or yes, in a that's... specific way. Like, yeah. for instance, Moses was called to lead the children of Israel from the Egyptian to bondage to the promised land, which is Canaan. Yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's actually interesting that you have um, brought up this idea of calling. They are related, but they are not identical. Um, so, and I see many people have put in the chat um, choosing, uh, choosing a, a leader or a selection. These are these are very good. God's chosen people. Yeah, yes, uh, Hannah, that is that is very good. Also, so let me. Um, slightly uh, enhance this, our idea, this understanding of election. And again, within the context of how uh, it is being used in our, in our patriarchal narrative, this idea of election comes to the surface, uh, especially in the story of Jacob and Esau, because God chooses, uh, he elects Jacob as the, as the person who is going to work, he's going to work through. And, and he says, Esau, the older is going to serve the younger. So what's going on here, partly, 
is that election is a gracious act on the part of God that conveys the idea that the promise involved in the covenant does not belong to the people uh, who, who are part of the covenant. It belongs to God. This, the, the promises do not have any human ownership. And so God is doing this again. He's, he's kind of uh, switching or, or turning upside down expectations. And he is choosing the weaker, the youngest, um, the unexpected. Uh, partly, again, there's more to election than just this. But um, a lot, some Bible scholars would point out that God uh, is doing this once again to show a difference uh, in in the the surrounding and how the surrounding religions would operate. Okay, in these religions, sometimes the the priests or the kings or the uh, religious kind of uh, workers would be uh, in a very privileged position and they would be in a powerful position and they could abuse that position uh, by lording it over the others. Uh, many of the kings, for instance, in uh, ancient Greece uh, or Mesopotamia or Egypt, they were understood to be descended from the gods. And so they could claim, and, and the Roman Empire did this for, for hundreds of years, they could claim, I am descended from a god. I am special. And so because I have this divine, uh, because I own this kind of divine attribute or trait, I have the right to do these things. But part of why God elects Jacob, why God elects this unknown, insignificant nation called Israel is because he wants to say, no, no, you guys do not possess the promise. It is not something that you can uh, hoard or claim as your own. The promise is of God. It belongs to God. And God gives it freely to whom he chooses. And the people who, that he chooses are um, chosen to, to uh, demonstrate uh, God's Love working through weakness. God's love working in the midst of sinfulness and prevailing, God's plan prevailing even though we humans mess it up repeatedly. So that's a little, um, a little bit about that idea of election. In the story of Jacob, uh, boy, lots of things happen. <laughs> Again, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to, to be concise. But one of the most important happens uh, in Genesis chapter 32. This is a, a crucial turning point. And we've already seen how Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham. Well, here we have a name change from Jacob, and his name becomes Israel. Uh, there in this story, you, can, you should read it for yourselves in Genesis chapter 32. Uh, Jacob is at a is at a crucial kind of moment in his in his life, and um, God comes down once again. We get this image of a of an intimate God who is involved with his people. And at first, Jacob doesn't realize necessarily who it is, but they wrestle. And Jacob, this kind of trickster, this uh, deceitful heel grabber. Uh, he says, I will not let go until you bless me. And so there is an element to this that God recognizes he is, that Jacob is still a trickster, but God also seems to uh, admire or, or approve of Jacob's perseverance. And so when, when God uh, releases uh, Jacob uh, and, and, he, and he blesses Jacob, he changes his name to Israel. Right from from Jacob, we have Jacob has uh, his sons become the the leaders of the twelve tribes of Israel, and from this moment, something very very important is kind of implanted or crystallized within the identity of the people of Israel, because the name Israel means God fights. The name Israel means God fights. And so 
there is a, an element of this that, that reminds us that Israel is going to continue in this covenant relationship, kind of uh, not fighting against, but wrestling with God in their attempts to obey, but continuing to sin. And God, in that, in that relationship, is not going to let go. He's not going to abandon them or, or, or kill them or wipe them out. But they have to remember one very important thing, that when they are fighting, uh, they are not fighting against God. It is God who is fighting on their behalf. And when it comes to the battles we will encounter later on in the, in the, New Test, in the Old Testament, um, they must remember that God is the one who is going to bring them victory. God is the reason that they will be prosperous, the reason that they will be successful. And if Israel tries to do all the fighting on their own, if they forget that the promises and the covenant are, are ultimately um, rooted in God, then they are going to fail. They are going to be upset. They are, uh, things are not going to go well. So this, this name Israel, God changes the name from Jacob, this supplanter, this trickster, the deceiver to Israel, which means God fights, uh, is, a, is an important turning point for Jacob uh, because we are supposed to remember, hey, it's no longer in your power to, to do things or to try to force the blessing. Remember, Jacob forces the blessing from his father and he steals it from Esau. And remember, Abraham and, and, his, and his wife, Sarah, tried to force the, the promise of God by having uh, sexual relations with Hagar. God says, no, no, no. I am the one who is fighting for you. Your responsibility, your part of the covenant is to be obedient to me, to follow my instructions, and I will fight for you. I will be the one who gives these promises to you. Okay, somebody, ha Victoria has a burning query still regarding the patriarchs. Um, uh, so in your assignment, you talked about uh, Moses as a patriarch. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. So um, let, me, let me put it this way. Uh, patriarch can be used in a general sense because it just means kind of the, the head of or kind of an important figure, okay? And in that sense, certainly Moses is a, is a, is a patriarchal figure. But in this lecture, and the, the three most important, I can say, okay, the most important patriarchs for the nation of Israel are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are the ones who really uh, set the course, who really get things started, who, uh, who form the core identity of what it means to be a person of Israel, okay? So Moses himself was in that, was in that line. F uh, Faith says, does it remind us of Israel's restoration? Uh, yes, I, 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 yes, it does. Um, and then Theresia says, uh, wrote, you also wrote about Moses. Uh, this is okay. It's okay if in your assignment you wrote about Moses. That's okay. Um, we are just focusing on these three, uh, these three bigger main patriarchs this evening, okay? Um, does anybody, we've, talk, we've talked about a lot here. Uh, does anybody have any other questions about the things I've said about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these ideas of election, um, covenant uh, typology. Anybody want to ask anything related to those topics? Okay, so yes, Isaac. I to yes, ask, Isaac. I wanted to ask if uh, are you really sure that uh, Isaac was willing to be sacrificed as a human sacrifice? And also, uh, is it that uh, God allows human sacrifice to this? to the day today. Could you repeat the second part of your question, please? Please. Okay. Uh, is it possible that human sacrifice can be accepted in this era of today? Uh, I, understand. Uh, I understand. Okay. okay. So as to the first question, um, it is not explicitly spelled out in the story, you know, Isaac saying very loudly, I am giving myself as a sacrifice. But most scholars agree that Isaac was a willing participant um, because of the language that's used, because of uh, 
how old he would have been and all of this type of stuff. So mo th there is general agreement that he was a willing participant. As to uh, human sacrifice today, I think it's very easy to condemn that and say uh, that is unacceptable. And in fact, uh, as a reminder, uh, um, part of what I mentioned, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, this part of this story is God um, demonstrating that he did not approve of human sacrifice either. The surrounding nations were doing it. And he seems to suggest that this is what, you know, he, he's testing Abraham. But really, uh, God says in many places, actually in the Old Testament, that he abhors, he hates uh, human sacrifices. Uh, this was practiced by many of the surrounding nations. Uh, one of the nations, there was a very famous god called Molech. And um, archaeological evidence suggests that the, 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 there was a statue of Molech and his, his stomach was kind of like an oven. And uh, human sacrifices, especially young children, were put in this oven and, and burned alive. And there were just horrible, horrible things. So God does not approve of human sacrifice. Um, we are to understand that story as uh, testing Abraham's faith and um, not as something that condones or approves of human sacrifice. Uh, okay, I have well, there's many questions. I'm, I'm happy that you're asking questions. Uh, uh, and I guess they're in the chat, that's okay. Well, I will work with them. Um, okay, yeah, the patriarchs are the founding fathers of Israel. Yeah, Jesus, Elphonse says that Jesus was the last human sacrifice. Um, that's, that's an interesting uh, comment I, in a way that I think that's true. Uh, is a patriarch like a prophet? <laughs> These are good questions. Um, there is a bit of, there is a bit of uh, overlap, we could say, between the patriarchs and the prophets. Um, so yes, they are like a prophet. Um, generally, the Bible itself refers to Moses as a, as a prophet and uh, refers to these other guys as, as patriarchs. So the terms are, let's see here, they're not exact. They're not meant to be exact technical terms. They are terms that we use when talking about these uh, stories to help us categorize things. That's really the purpose of the term, uh, to help us um, make categories. And, and like I said, the people of Israel thought of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, as their patriarchs. That's how they thought about the, the beginning of their own uh, nation, the beginning as a people, okay? Laura, how can human sacrifice be accepted if the commandment is you shall not kill and this was changed during the Ten Commandments? Uh, yes, so that's a, that's a good point. Um, we should remember this story of Abraham and Isaac happens before the Ten Commandments, so we are going to talk about those Ten Commandments next week. But absolutely, God is very clear, killing is, is not good. We did see that in the story of Cain and Abel, uh, and, and God is very um, clear that he does not approve. Cain did a very sinful, very uh, horrible thing. Is Noah one of the patriarchs? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, again, the, if we use these, if we understand these terms kind of loosely, the problem with calling Noah a patriarch is that he um, he is not in, so he is before Abraham. So so God says to Abraham, "I'm going to make you into a great nation." And if we imagine Abraham as the start of this family tree, right, and all of these nations come from Abraham, then Abraham is the father of all of of Israel. God gave his problem to, promise to Abraham. Noah was before that. So he's not really included there, but he's kind of, he's, we, we called it, we're choosing in this course to refer to those stories as the primeval um, narrative. So kind of before the nation of Israel gets its beginning. So there, are, so there are the 25 prophets or there are specific ones like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only. Um, Fatma asked this question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to be, this will be my, this will be the last, um, question that, that I'll address this. Um, they are, they are, uh, somewhat relevant, these questions, different 
people, and for that matter, actually, uh, Islam has different uh, lists of who the prophets are. So in, within the faith of Islam, uh, uh, Jesus, for instance, is, is regarded as a prophet, and there are different kind of lists. Um, we've talked about, it, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, the divisions of the Hebrew Bible. Remember, we have the Torah, we have the uh, Navim, which are the prophets, and we have the Ketavim, which are the writings. And so uh, within uh, Hebrew understanding, the prophets are some very important people who, um, who are able to communicate God's messages to his, to his people, to the nations. And I would say, um, rather than having an exact lift, list of prophets themselves, it, it's more, the understanding is more connected to the, the writings of the prophets. So we have in, within the Hebrew Bible what are called the major and the minor prophets sometimes. But in addition, there are many other prophets or people who act uh, prophetically that we, that we don't hear about. And, and so once again, these terms are, are there, there's a bit of overlap and they are not meant to be exact, precise, technical terms, okay? Uh, Shepard, I saw you had your hand raised. Do you wanna ask a question? Yes, yes, I would like to ask. Uh... Uh, may you uh, help me just to clarify this issue? I just want to relate. There's a set, certain verse. The, I just want to link or relate this idea of uh, election with this okay. verse, which says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Yes. And so, so where are you getting that? Many are called, few are, ch are chosen. Okay, this one is one of the verses that is in the Gospels, in Matthew, uh, Luke, yes. etc. Yes. yes. So, so in this context, we yeah. see that... Okay, you, you can explain to yeah, yeah. It's, so, my question. It, is it, was a, it was a rhetorical question. I know where the verse comes from. I was just, for the benefit of others, just asking. Um, because that is in the New Testament, um, yeah. I want to kind of leave that aside. And so... Um, I don't think that that is uh, the, the best thing to use our time on talking about now, but thank you for your question. Um, uh, yeah, there are other questions. Uh, define typology. Please go back and uh, in the recorded lecture if you want to get that. I, there are a few more things I want to communicate in our last 10 minutes. So um, please allow me to do that. Um, Jacob who we talked about, who, who becomes Israel, has uh, 12 sons, and they become, like I said, the heads of different tribes of Israel. Um, some of you may recognize their names. You can read about these names and, and the last kind of chapters of Genesis, Reuben and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Benjamin, and then uh, Joseph, uh, who is uh, kind of, again, the runt of the family. And this story is, is worth uh, talking about a bit because it really ties together and, and um, concludes this patriarchal narrative, okay? So I'm going to show another uh, graphic here. And what this demonstrates is the way that with it, Jacob has his 12 sons, okay? And they are... Uh, surprisingly sinful actually they do are they're doing a lot of uh things that are not good and the the runt of the family joseph is mistreated by his brothers and he is sold into slavery but god chooses him to accomplish his purposes okay so i'm going to share my screen one last time here and we are going to zoom over to this to this uh graphic which is a comparison of one of the brothers, Judah, who eventually becomes uh, the tribe of Judah, is very prominent, and then his, the and then his younger brother Joseph. Okay, so the text uh, makes some pretty intentional comparisons between the behaviors of these two brothers, and once again in this story we see that um, these patriarchs, the, these early these forefathers of Israel, they're not perfect; they are sinful. And, but God is able to work in the midst of this sinfulness in spite 
of sinful, rebellious behavior. So Judah goes to a foreigner um, of his own will, whereas Joseph, after being sold into slavery by his brothers, is taken to Egypt against his will. Judah commits sexual immorality by going in uh, to, to be with his daughter-in-law, whereas Joseph is a really a shining example of uh, sexual uh, morality. He resists the seduction uh, the, the, the seduction that comes from Potiphar's wife. Um, then Judah, uh, he leaves his seal and his cord. Joseph, when, when Potiphar's wife is trying to grab him, he, she takes his garment and he leaves that garment behind. Okay. Judah is an accuser. He, he's called an accuser, but Joseph himself is falsely accused. And because of that uh, false accusation, he is thrown into prison where he spends uh, quite a long time. Judah uh, receives the judgment of God. Uh, Joseph receives the blessing of God. And then finally, uh, down here, the last row, we have uh, Judah, who is the recipient of a true accusation of a woman. And once again, that is kind of contrasted with Joseph, who receives the false, false accusation of a woman. So uh, the reason I've shown that is because we are uh, meant to kind of realize that um, sometimes the people who should be expected uh, to behave uh, obediently to God are not the ones who do that. And God chooses to work through Joseph to accomplish some really um, wonderful things, not just for God's people. So here's a, here's a little foretaste of God using Abraham and his descendants to be a blessing to the nations. Okay. So God, there's a famine that happens and, uh, Jacob's family go, goes to Egypt and they are able to be sustained because there is food in Egypt. In the ancient world, Egypt was known as the bread basket of the world because they had a lot of grain there. But also Joseph's wisdom uh, that God blesses him with is, uh, leads him to store up grain. Uh, he tells the Pharaoh to store up grain. And that grain ends up uh, being, ends up sustaining even the Egyptians through this famine. And so God is able to um, do some, uh, able to give blessings, able to do good things through Joseph, whom he elects whom he chooses, uh, even though he is not the, the firstborn. Um, in, that, in the story at the, at the very end of Genesis, uh, we see that Jacob is blessing his sons and he gives, uh, Jake, uh, he gives Joseph what's sometimes called the double blessing, which was intended for the uh, firstborn, just as Jacob himself received the blessing that should have gone to his older brother, Esau, okay? Now, one final, final uh, uh, kind of way to wrap this all up is one of my favorite verses, which comes from Genesis chapter uh, 50, verse 20. I'm going to go there um, so that I can read it for us. And this is a really concise statement of how God is able to work in the midst of sinfulness and brokenness in order to accomplish his purposes. So uh, Joseph's brothers have come to Egypt and they uh, feel very remorseful about what they did to him when they sold him into sl slavery. But Joseph says this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says, as for you, you meant to harm me when you sold me into slavery. But God intended it for a good purpose so that he could preserve the lives of many people as you see this day. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Um, and, and that mirrors the way that God provides for his people and that God is able to uh, maintain his part of the covenant, his part of the contract, the agreement. He never breaks it even though the people of Israel, the patriarchs, break it repeatedly again and again 
and again by disobeying, by worshiping idols, and by doing all these things. So that concludes the, the lecture of these, these stories of the, the patriarchs. Uh, next week, we will discuss the uh, story of the Exodus. Reverend Kisoy is scheduled to uh, lecture on that. And I want to allow just a few more minutes here, maybe two or three minutes for any last lingering questions or anything that I might be able to say to uh, clarify or to help you understand the, these patriarchal narratives better. Anybody have any questions or last thoughts? Uh, Sylvia has left the meeting. Sorry, I thought she raised her hand. <laughs> I have all these things popping up on my screen. Okay, Sheila, would you like to ask your question? I saw you raised a hand. No. Um, if you want, you can ask a question in the chat. Uh, it's not my preferred mode, but I know sometimes you have difficulty with microphones. Any last questions? Okay. Well then, uh, thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for your focus and for your questions uh, this evening. Um, uh, I will post the notes that I have used on our ENAS page in this uh, section uh, and uh, they will be useful to you, uh, I hope, in that regard. As we close, I want to ask a volunteer, please, somebody could um, pray for us as we as we depart. Could somebody please pray for us as we as we end? All right, let's pray. Okay, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this platform, for this opportunity to learn things about your kingdom. And Lord, we ask that as we, we, we learn these things, as we take on these lectures, that Lord, it will not just be to accomplish the finishing of this unit, but it will be to understand the business of how you do your things in your kingdom, to glorify your name in all our influences. We want to say thank you to our Reverend, who is a good lecturer, who, who labors to prepare and explain to the detail and is, is careful to make sure that we understand. No, we are, no, we are passing back from you. Thank you for everyone who has attended the sentence. And as we and plan to learn to learn to learn to learn in the name of the name of the pray, amen. 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 Thank you very much Thank for praying. Much. Thank you all again for attending the lecture. Um, this recording will be posted on uh, the Google folder, but you must use your ANU email to access it. Good night. Uh, you too. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Good night, man. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 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 <laughs>